Street View viewing area, Western parts of Cole County, out towards, say, the Russellville area, and west from the capital city on 50. You'll notice that thunderstorm. Yeah. Yeah. You'll hear those rumbles of thunder. Down to our south, moving towards the Scumbia, there's another line there. This is your one hundred thousand dollar bonus. So mostly, we do not forget about these guys. Research in the same point that it brings you. It doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. I guess the answer that should be an enemy is she now creates the earth. I'm going to be the first time. I am the only possibly being just wrong. Who's our candidate and who is going to be our girl, Sean? Because she's more conservative than he is. I think she would be stronger on the war on terrorism. <laughs> you I absolutely believe that. Yeah, that, 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 that. That's the one area I disagree with. Today, she has turned her millions of adoring fans over to New Age Duck. And I'm reading both of his stories. I really hope it's really opened my eyes up to a new way of thinking, a new form of spirituality that doesn't always align with the teachings of Christian, Christianity. So my question is, you, Oprah, how do you reconcile these spirituals with your Christian beliefs? Well, you ever drive down the road at night and uh, get temporarily blinded by the headlights of another car coming toward you? You know what I mean? Like when, when they have their high beams on and they're coming down the opposite lane. And uh, so you flash your lights at them and then they turn their actual high beams on. <laughs> Can't see anything at all. That's happened to me more times than I'd like to admit. And if you're not careful, man, you can almost become mesmerized by those oncoming lights, certainly distracted by them. I hate it when that happens, and I've noticed the older I get, the more I seem to be affected by that. And I've, I've been wearing glasses, by the way, since I was 14 years old. And of course, now they're full-blown progressives. Like, I can't see anything at any distance anymore without my glasses on. And the, uh, one of the situations that I have the very hardest time with is driving at night. And if it's raining, it seems to be even worse, you know, when cars are, are coming toward me, especially the newer cars, because their headlights are so bright. And then uh, with the wet roads and wet windshield, the glare from those headlights makes it really difficult sometimes for me to see. And so about 30 years ago, when my father was teaching me to drive, maybe 31 years ago, he told me when that happens, to focus on that white line, on the right-hand side of the road. He said, you just focus on that white line. Don't, don't stare at the headlights and put your right wheel right over there on that line and that will guide you past that distraction, past those headlights until you can see clearly again where you're going. And sure enough, uh, to this day, I do that when a car with particularly bright headlights is coming toward me and I've found that that white line has never failed to guide me past the distraction. It works every single time. And the reason it works is not because my vision has changed, right? When the, when the bright lights are coming, I, I still have the same eyes, right? When it's not like I've been equipped with some new device, right? Or talent to be able to get past the problem. I'm wearing the same glasses, driving the way I always drive. The only thing that is changing is my point of focus, Right? All I'm doing is changing what I'm focused on. Everything else stays the same. The distraction is the same. That car with the bright lights is still coming. My circumstances are the same. I'm, I'm still driving down the road at night. The conditions are still the same. It's still raining. What makes the difference in how I get past that distraction is what I choose to focus on. And of course, you can apply that analogy to many areas in life. Uh, have you ever seen the video clips of a race where the person in the lead starts to celebrate before they cross the finish line. And then at the last moment, the person who was in second place overtakes the leader who's just, you know, jumping up and down and celebrating. And that person that was in second ends up winning the race. 
it's all about focus. When the person in the lead stops focusing on the goal, on the finish line, they get overtaken by one of their obstacles to winning the race, namely the people they're running against, right? So what you focus on in life determines where you end up in life, right? Which is why focus is so very important. And we started talking about this last week, how the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Colossians was addressing this same issue of maintaining our focus on Christ when distractions and dangers and obstacles try to come between us and the goal he has set before us. And the message couldn't be any more timely for us today because I'm telling you, we are, we are an incredibly distracted culture. And I mean even our church culture in America. We have become so focused on distractions for so long that we no longer recognize the true goal of the Christian life, at least for many, because we've become uh, intoxicated. We, we've become mesmerized, distracted by so much of what is happening in our world, which is constantly coming at us through you know, media and advertising and internet and television and educational institutions, our government, even, uh, even personal relationships, and on and on and on it goes. We're continually being told uh, what our agenda for life should be by every organization and corporation and social movement and political party and even well-meaning friends and family that want a hand in shaping the future of our world, which is fine. That's fine. But listen, for the Christian... For those who've been raised with Christ, as Paul puts it, there is only one agenda that should concern us above all others, and that is the agenda of Jesus Christ, otherwise known as the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the only answer to what ails this world. Okay? The gospel is the only agenda that can offer human beings real hope for their future, and Paul certainly understood that, which is one of the reasons he wrote these letters from a prison in Rome to begin with, to remind Christians that although this world is full of people who will try to distract us with all sorts of agendas of their own, the only agenda worth pursuing is the one that is laid out for us by Christ. And so to the Philippians, Paul wrote, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Philippians 3, 13 through 16, Paul's saying if you're a follower of Christ, then you've already attained what you need in order to pursue that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So look, stop focusing on distractions. Start focusing on Him, right? Your, your problems in life should not be your primary focus in life, right? No matter how bad they may be, and, and actually that's true with the good things in your life as well. Your career should not be your primary focus in this life. Your physical appearance should not be your primary focus in this life. Your wealth, your wealth should not be your primary focus in this life. The, the material things that you want to purchase or possess should not be your primary focus in this life. Listen, your spouse should not be your primary focus in this life. Your family should not be your primary focus in this life. Your ministry it should not be your primary focus in this life. As good and as important as all of those things can be, if you focus on them more than you do on Jesus Christ himself, then they've become distractions from your true purpose in this life. That's why Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. It's not because he wants you to ditch your family, by the way. 
No, he's saying compared to him, you should never allow even the best things in life to distract you from the upward call of God in Christ Jesus because you cannot follow him. You cannot be his disciple if there's anything in your life at all that you focus on more than you focus on him. So look, whether it's something really good in your life or something really bad, maybe you're going through a tremendously difficult season in your life right now, certainly don't ignore it, but don't let it distract you from focusing on Jesus Christ more than even that problem, because at the end of the day, he's the answer you're looking for. This is the message that the Apostle Paul was trying to get across to the Christians in the church at Colossae who were being led away from Jesus Christ and his church through some false teaching that had really begun to take root there. And so Paul writes this letter to encourage them to keep their focus on Christ and not the false teaching or even the false teachers themselves. And so this sermon today is part two of last week's message and then the the final installment of this series in Colossians as we work our way through this last chapter of the letter. And here Paul gives us three more teaching points in regard to keeping our focus fixed on Christ, no matter what distractions may come our way. And last week we covered points one through four, so today we'll cover points five, six, and seven. If you missed last week, uh, you can go back on our YouTube channel or our uh, mobile app or our website, and, and it should be on there. So let's turn there together then to Colossians chapter four, picking up where we left off last week, and we'll see what Paul has to say in the final part of this letter about about what it takes for us to remain focused on Christ even in the most challenging seasons of life. We'll begin by reading the first four verses. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So this, the first verse here, it's really a final comment on the discussion at the end of chapter 3. It probably should have been attached to the end of chapter 3 instead of the beginning of chapter 4. Uh, we covered 3 last week as Paul talks about the relationship between bond servants and their masters. Okay, In the uh, Roman Empire... People were, were either slaves or they were free, and it, it had nothing to do uh, with race or ethnicity. Rather, anyone could become a slave, and any slave could become free. And so unlike uh, slavery in North America in the 18th and 19th centuries, slavery in the Greco-Roman world of the first century functioned a lot like a credit system. Uh, to pay their debts, people had the option to sell themselves into slavery until their debts were paid back. In fact, slaves could hold positions of authority over other people. They could even own property. However, their masters still legally assumed complete authority over them while they were working to pay back their debts, and they could therefore, under the law, freely uh, mistreat their slaves as they desired. And so Paul was in, in no way condoning the practice of slavery, you understand. In fact, Paul never commends slavery of any kind. On the contrary, he recognizes that slaves and masters were actually equal before Christ and therefore should treat one another appropriately according to who they are in Christ. And again, all of that really relates uh, more to the end of chapter 3 than it does to the rest of uh, chapter 4 here. So we'll move on where in verse 2, Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So again, rather than focusing on the problem that the Colossian Christians are facing, uh, namely the false teachers and their teaching, Paul turns the focus back to Christ when he says, if you're a Christian, if you've been raised with Christ, then pray watchfully. And of course, as followers of Christ, we know that we're supposed to pray, right? We talk about that often. But what does it mean exactly to pray watchfully? Well, if you read Paul's words here, In the ancient Greek, the phrase being watchful is the Greek word gregorio, which literally means to keep awake or or to be vigilant or alert. And it's used throughout the New Testament as a call for Christians 
to be alert or watchful, to be awake in light of the imminent return of Christ. It is used in that context most frequently. We see that um, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We see it in 1 Thessalonians, also in Revelation in several places. However, what is so compelling about the use of that word here is the fact that what the watchful believers are to do, at least where this particular word is used here, is not just to watch for Christ's imminent return, but to watch their own lives specifically in light of Christ's imminent return. This is a very different thing, to be awake to the nature of the times that we're living in and then to orient our lives to those times accordingly. In other words, don't get caught up with the distractions of this life because there are many and they will lull you to sleep, spiritually speaking. So Paul says, stay awake, be vigilant, be watchful, be alert, remain aware of the times you're living in prayerfully. Listen, Peter said, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion roaring, uh, seeking someone to devour, 1 Peter 5.8. When he says, be watchful, guess what word he uses? Gregorio, the same word Paul uses in verse 2 of our story here. In Mark 14, 38, when Jesus' betrayal and arrest were imminent and the Roman soldiers are on their way to arrest him, Jesus says to his disciples, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. When he says watch and pray, he uses that word Gregorio. You, you get the idea. Praying watchfully is praying with an awareness of the times and the culture we're living in, being aware, awake to the dangerous nature of the distractions that constantly threaten to lull us to sleep spiritually until we're of no use to anyone for the sake of the gospel. Yet I think, I think that describes so much of the church in the West today. We've been lulled to sleep by comfort and peace and prosperity and security and, and an easy Americanized version of the gospel that requires little of us and therefore has little effect on anyone else. You see, there, there's much power in prayer, but the church needs to wake up when we pray to pray watchfully, to take seriously the effects that decades of cultural distractions have had on the church in this country, to finally be vigilant, alert in our prayers, understanding the times so that we can live our lives radically committed to the cause of Christ, forsaking the ease of a cheap gospel that costs us nothing and changes no one. Paul says, wake up when you pray. Be aware of what is going on around you when you pray. Seek after God's voice. Seek after God's will for every situation and circumstance that you're facing when you pray. In other words, stop praying for what you want and start praying for what God wants. That is when you will start seeing your prayers actually change the people and circumstances around you. Yet so often we, you know, we sort of treat God like some kind of cosmic vending machine. You know, when we pray, you just put in a little prayer and then get something good back out of it. Paul says, no, that's not how it works. You be aware of your surroundings when you pray and seek God's will in your prayers because Paul knows that prayer can actually shake the foundations of this world that you're living in. But Paul says you have to pray watchfully, steadfastly, and continually. Abandoning the distractions in your life that have lulled you to sleep, learning to pray for what God wants instead of just praying for what you want. And then, he says, then watch your prayers move mountains. That's what it means to pray watchfully. Let's keep reading verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So Paul says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. The word walk, we've talked about it several times in the last few weeks throughout this letter. It's the ancient Greek word peripeteo, uh, which Paul uses quite a bit, 
not just in this letter, but throughout his writings. And it was used as a, a Hebrew idiom, a saying to refer to how a person conducts their life. It, it pictured a road, uh, our life as a journey that we were on. And we've talked about that again before because Paul uses that word a lot. But the point is, Paul was saying, be wise employ a lot of wisdom as you live out your life among unbelievers because look you can very easily become distracted otherwise right how many times have we heard about christians who were once serving god faithfully but started spending all of their time with unbelievers and the next thing you know that christian is no longer following jesus christ now keeping that in mind paul is decidedly not saying if you're a christian Avoid unbelievers. Now, in fact, it's actually just the opposite. Paul's saying, as you live out your life among unbelievers, which you should be doing, apply all of the wisdom of Christ that you have been taught in those relationships. And then he goes on to talk about what that looks like, which we'll get into in a moment. But we just want to establish first that if you're a Christian, if you've been raised with Christ, then Paul says, make sure you have meaningful relationships in your life with those who are not following Christ. And as you do that, always be careful to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. And just to be clear, wisdom is something that we apply to a situation or a circumstance or a relationship before we ever open our mouths. Before we speak, okay, wisdom is that crucial stage between thought and action. Right? When you're about to step into a situation or a conversation with an unbeliever, your mind processes what is about to happen first, and then at some point after that, you speak or take some kind of action based on that situation or conversation or relationship. And if wisdom is going to be applied there, it's going to happen sometime between your thoughts and your actions, which is one of the reasons so many believers get into trouble in their relationships with unbelievers, because they don't apply wisdom between their thoughts and actions in those relationships. They just react based on their own feelings or desires in the moment. It's exactly why some of the Christians in Colossae were leaving the church, because they were reacting to the attraction of these mystery cults without applying any of the wisdom of Christ that they've been taught. They were too easily distracted by the allure of something that they desired to have. It was something new and they wanted it, which means they were easily led astray. And so Paul says, listen, slow down for a second. Before you act, before you speak, and first process what's being presented to you by weighing it against what you've already been given by way of the gospel of Christ. You see, that, that's wisdom. And then only after you've applied that wisdom should you react. Only then should you speak. And when you do, Paul says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each person, okay, that's the result of the wisdom that you apply to that situation or conversation before you ever open up your mouth and respond. Okay, look, uh, the Great Commission, leading others to Christ, is more about winning hearts than it is about winning arguments, which is why the moment our disagreements with unbelievers turn nasty, you know, with all the vitriol that you see on social media these days, for instance, at that point, we're actually working against the cause of Christ in our efforts because we may be winning arguments, but we're losing people's hearts at the same time. That's why Paul says, let your speech always be gracious because sharing the truth of Christ and sharing the love of Christ should never be mutually exclusive. Those two powerful elements of the gospel are actually inextricably linked. They should never be separated. So Paul says, look, apply wisdom before you speak, and then when you do speak, always be gracious. And then once you've applied the wisdom of Christ and the grace of Christ in how you respond, then make sure your actual response is seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. It's a very, uh, actually a very compelling use of words by Paul. Okay, it's closely tied in 
with the idea of using wisdom. We find that um, ancient rabbinic literature often associates salt with wisdom, but it's much more than that here, okay? The, the way Paul uses this metaphor of seasoning our conversations with salt suggests that Christians should speak in a way that is actually interesting, stimulating, wise and winsome, attractive, appealing speech. Our speech, our conversations, especially with unbelievers, should never be witless, useless, foolish, mindless talk. In fact, according to the phrase seasoned with salt, our conversations about Jesus Christ and his gospel should never even be flat or boring. No, Paul says they should be winsome, attractive, interesting to the listener, which is exactly how our lives are to be lived out in this world, by the way. Jesus said that we are the salt of the earth. Matthew 5, 13. So our speech and our lives then are to flavor and preserve everything they come in contact with because that's what salt does. It flavors and preserves the food it is applied to, which means as followers of Jesus Christ, listen, we need to have more to say than a few old worn out cliches about what it means to follow Christ. We need more than bumper sticker sayings about our faith. We need more than a handful of go-to Bible verses to be able to effectively represent and defend the gospel. In the Acts of the Apostles, Luke describes an interaction between a follower of Christ named Stephen and a wide variety of Jews and Greek-speaking Gentiles who came there to debate with him. Luke describes the event this way. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Acts 6, 9, and 10. You guys, you understand? Christians should be the most interesting and winsome people on the planet Earth. Our speech when we talk to people is supposed to be engaging, interesting, attractive, compelling, and full of the wisdom of Christ. We should be the kind of people that other people want to listen to. But if, if their only interaction with professing believers is uh, angry and arrogant people on social media who are bent on winning every single argument, or Christians in person who don't know enough about their own faith to be able to discuss the gospel in a way that is gracious and articulate and interesting, then how could we ever expect them to want to come to our churches or listen to anything that we have to say at all? This is what it means to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. It's being prepared before we speak to have something to say that is actually worth listening to. The apostle Peter said, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Be winsome. Right, First Peter 3.15, which is another way of saying, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Okay? Look, God didn't call us out of darkness into his marvelous light to be uninteresting, uninformed, untrained, scripturally illiterate, unable to hold our own in a conversation, people of faith. No, Peter said, you're a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession that you, you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter 2.9, that is a description of the most interesting people in the world proclaiming the most captivating message the world could ever hope to hear. And it has nothing whatsoever, by the way, to do with diplomas or degrees. All you need is a, is a good Bible. I'll buy you one if you don't have one. All you need is a good Bible a little time, 
a lot of commitment and the Holy Spirit inside of you and your conversations will become something people will actually look forward to because your words will be dripping with the pure life and light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want your life and speech to be exhilarating, seasoned with salt, then live in the word of God. Live in the word of God and you will begin to live out the word of God. I'm telling you, when that happens, I promise you, you will forget what a boring life ever felt like. Okay, let's finish the letter then. Paul goes through some final greetings here and instructions concerning these letters he's writing, which seems uh, somewhat innocuous on a a cursory reading, but there's actually more to it. We'll see. And we're going to pay close attention, especially to the bit in the middle of this last section as Paul makes one final important statement about those who've been raised with Christ. Let's read verse 7 to the end. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that we may encourage your hearts. And With him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. He's referring to those who are Jews with him. And they have been a comfort to me. These are the Gentiles. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, Jesus greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and Nympha and the church in her house. When this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So in the last part of the letter, uh, Paul lists these people who are with him, and he describes how faithful and valuable they've been to Paul, and indeed also to the churches in the Lycus River Valley, which is where Colossae is, uh, and certainly to many churches far beyond there. And what's interesting about that, when you consider the context of the letter, the fact that it's being written to a church where many of the believers are deserting their faith and commitment to Christ, they're, they're falling away, from the gospel and instead following this new false teaching. With that in mind, what is interesting is to consider the recipients of the letter in light of the people who are sending the letter. The men Paul mentions here, the people who are ministering so faithfully to Paul and to these churches, the people he's just described as being beloved brothers, faithful ministers, fellow servants in the Lord, fellow workers for the kingdom of God, servants of Jesus Christ, always struggling on behalf of the church. What is interesting about Paul's description of these faithful brothers in the Lord is just how many of them were guilty of desertion in one form or another in their own lives. Okay, Onesimus, mentioned in verse 9, was a runaway slave from the household of Philemon. He deserted his post and the family he was committed to until later encountering Paul in Rome. Mark, mentioned in verse 10, is the same person as John Mark who deserted the mission of Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13 and went back home to Jerusalem when there was yet much work to be done. And as a result, Paul and Barnabas deserted one another in Acts 15 going their separate ways. And then Demas, mentioned in verse 14, is described by Paul in 2 Timothy 4 as deserting him and going to Thessalonica. You see, look, I just don't believe it's coincidence that God has chosen to use a bunch of men guilty of deserting their faith and each other to encourage and minister truth to a bunch of Christians who are guilty of deserting their faith and each other. It must have been immensely encouraging for Paul to write to them 
about their pastor Epaphras, who is with Paul, who Paul describes as always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Well, why is their pastor struggling in praying for them? Because they're deserting their faith and each other in droves, and it's breaking his heart. And yet in the same breath, Paul says that Epaphras is praying that they will stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Interesting, it's a prayer that he would not be praying if there was no hope for them since they're failing miserably in their faith. So clearly, there is hope. In fact, if you've been raised with Christ, there is nothing but hope. And the men who are sending the letter are living proof of that hope to those who are receiving that letter that no matter how miserably we fail in living out the gospel, even when we desert the faith in each other, if we have truly been raised with Christ, there is always hope for us to be able to stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Okay, when, when we sin against God and others as Christians, we grieve the Holy Spirit within us which Paul warns us against in Ephesians 4.30. And so although as Christians our sins have certainly been forgiven, securing for us an eternal hope in Christ, we can still grieve that relationship with him when we pursue distractions in our lives rather than his will for our lives. What happens is we distance ourselves from him, deserting that closeness with him and others that he created us to have. And so we confess our sins we repent, we forsake those distractions and we draw near to God as James says and when we do that, he draws near to us which restores that closeness. This is what Epaphras was struggling with in his prayers on their behalf that they would forsake these distractions, this false teaching and the false teachers and instead draw near to God to be restored to him and to their brothers and sisters in Christ in the church who they were distancing themselves from. Jesus said, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. And of course we see evidence in this letter that Paul and John Mark were reconciled. Right? Paul also speaks favorably about Barnabas, which he mentions here and in 1 Corinthians 9 and also in Galatians 2. And then in his letter to Philemon, we find Paul instructing Philemon to reconcile with Onesimus. All right? these, were, these were serious breaches of faith and trust among brothers in Christ. And yet these men were restored to Christ and to each other, mature and fully assured in all the will of God. And because they were restored to Christ and to each other, they were able to pray the same for these Colossian Christians who were failing miserably. Now listen, you may have a major failure in your past. In fact, in fact you may be failing in your faith and relationships right now. Listen to me, without question, there is hope for you because our hope is not in what we are able to achieve. Our hope is in what Jesus Christ has already achieved, which means no matter how far you've fallen, no matter how great the failure, no matter how big of a mess you've made of your life and relationships, you are never far from grace and forgiveness and restoration, mature and fully assured in all the will of God because, listen, Jesus Christ is ready. The moment you submit your will to his in humble repentance, he is ready to restore your life and mend your relationships. You see, no matter how hard you try, there will always be times in your life when you fail. That is true for every single one of us. But if you've been raised with Christ, he's already overcome every single one of those failures. Every one you've ever committed and every one you're ever going to commit, which means your hope is secure in him and in what he has done, not in the successes and failures that you stack up in your life over time. Bible scholar David Garland wrote, we can never succeed on our own. 
The good news of the gospel is that we do not have to. We live in Christ and triumph through him. All right, clearly we're commanded as believers to confess our sins to one another. James, the brother of Jesus, wrote to the church, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. James 5, 16. Not because we need to be saved over and over and over and over and over again, but to see our relationships with each other healed and our closeness to God restored as we turn our focus away from the distractions in our lives and back onto him, which is his will for us which means the moment we draw near to God in humble confession and repentance, that is the moment he brings us back to that place of maturity, fully assured in all the will of God. Okay, no matter how messed up your life and relationships may be right now, if you have been raised with Christ, if you're a believer, a Christian, the Holy Spirit can redeem and reconcile every bit of that mess in your life you just have to draw near to him, his will, instead of your own. It's all about focus. So many Christians have become so focused on distractions for so long that we no longer recognize the true goal of the Christian life. We've been captivated, mesmerized by a myriad of distractions, losing our focus on the very reason we were put here on this earth to begin with. A friend of mine, another minister, recently said, the church has been on such a rapid decline, a sharp slide down for so long, we've become intoxicated by the ride. The truth is, there's no shortage of distractions available to us in this culture we're living in today. Many of those distractions in and of themselves can be good things, right? Making a good living is good. Having nice things is nice. <laughs> Looking great is great. But those things and so many other good things can become distractions that take our focus off of Christ if we allow them to. Listen, our problems, to be sure, our problems can distract us from focusing on Christ. In fact, you may be going through a tremendously difficult season in your life right now. By all means, don't ignore it. But don't let it distract you from focusing on Jesus Christ more than even that problem because at the end of the day, he is the answer you're looking for. In fact, he's the wealth that we're all looking for. He's the treasure that we all long for. He's the image that we all strive for. He's the family that we live for and the only one worth dying for. He is in fact the sum total of everything we could ever want or need in this life and the next. So why settle for distractions when you've been raised with Christ? If you will but live your life focused on him, Pray watchfully, walk in wisdom, and stand mature, fully assured in all the will of God. You will not easily be led astray, but you will lose your taste for the distractions of this world and yet want for nothing. Let's pray.